The announcement of the new Eureka Orthos has finally convinced you to give Deep Dungeons a go, but sadly, if you want to try it when the patch comes around, then one thing stands in your way, that pesky Palace of the Dead checkpoint. And rather than try it with a group of strangers through the party finder, you've decided you want to do it solo. And considering that people regularly attempt to do this for all 200 floors, the beginning 50 or nothing as long as you know what to do. The first step in your journey is obviously going to be unlocking the Deep Dungeon. This is done by completing a quest that can be found in Rikadanya called the House That Death Built. This quest will ultimately bring you to Quarry Mill, where this NPC will allow you to enter the palace. However, before entering the dungeon, there's a few things you should do or know to prepare yourself, starting with consumables. Not every job is going to have a good form of sustain or mitigation, and since you'll be finding everything alone, you'll need to find a way to alleviate this. We do this through items like potions for healing and food for extra health. Though you may not use things like super potions and trials or raids, for deep dungeons they are a must. And while the damage given by food isn't going to be that impactful, the extra vitality can go a long way to providing added durability. On the other hand, something you don't need to worry about is equipment. This is because deep dungeons have both independent leveling and gearing. For your level, you will always start at 1, gaining experience as you kill mobs and bosses until you reach the max of 60 for Palace of the Dead. As for equipment, it's based on a resource called Aether Bolt. When you open a silver chest, you can gain this resource for either your weapon or armor, up to a max of 99 for each. Every time your Aether Bolt increases, so will your damage reduction and or damage done. What all this means is whether you enter with a fully geared level 90 job or one you just picked up, they will both be starting on an equal playing field. Speaking of which, what job should you go in as? Well, you have options. Every job is capable of going the full 200 solo, with the second half being where certain jobs will begin to struggle. However, if you're just looking for the best option, then the King of Palace is Machinist. Being ranged allows them to kite infinitely, and Machinist has the highest personal DPS of this role. Head graze being an interrupt means that mimics are a non-issue, removing one of the biggest threats you'll face. And their only real con is their lack of sustain, leaving you to rely on second wind and potions to stay alive. After you make your choice of job, then you'll be ready to enter the pallet. To do this, you'll need to talk to the NPC, choose the first option, and pick one of the two available profile slots. After that, just choose to enter as a fixed party and you'll be going in solo. Now that you're actually inside the palace, the first thing you want to do is start gaining levels. One of the biggest mistakes people make when starting out is going too fast, moving on to the next floor as soon as they are able. But until you reach the max level of 60, you want to take things slow, clearing out every floor for as much experience as possible. The extra levels will be one of the biggest factors to keeping you alive. While clearing out the floors, you should also try to open any and all chests you see. Bronze chests will drop random items like potions, phoenix sounds, and pot shards, which are a currency you can use to exchange for palace rewards. Silver chests are likely the most important for you starting out because as mentioned earlier, they are the primary way of increasing your aether pool, making most every one you open a permanent increase to strength assuming you clear the 10 floors. The last type is gold chests that have items called pomanders which are unique to deep dungeons and have a separate inventory that holds them. These pomanders serve as unique buffs for the dungeon, each doing something different and impactful from increasing damage to transforming enemies into helpless animals. Selecting these pomanders, similar to obtaining levels, are important to keeping you alive as a clutch witching or rage might be the only way to salvage a bad situation. Something to know is that you can only ever hold three of each kind, and for this reason, you should be smart with how you use them. Some can be burned at any time, like affluences or alterations, but others like lusts or serenities are best used when you can get the most out of them. As a general rule, I would try to keep a max stack of most of the pomanders, only burning things like witchings if you get swarmed or if absolutely necessary. When opening a gold chest and receiving a pomander that you already have max of, it will close, allowing you to open it again once you have the space. You can use this to your advantage, burning a palm when you find a replacement for it. This is especially useful for things like strength and steel. Something to be wary of when opening chests is the possibility of mimics or exploding chests. Mimics hit rather hard, but the real danger comes from the ability Infatuate. This inflicts a punishing debuff called Pox. It lasts for 10 minutes and turns off your natural regen, while also causing you to take constant damage. And the only way to cure the debuff is with the Purity Pomander. While exploring, you also want to be wary of traps. Randomly spread throughout each floor will be invisible traps that once stepped on will produce a negative effect depending on the type of trap. Landmine traps will explode dealing 8% of your health to you and nearby enemies, and feeble traps will inflict a debuff increasing the damage you take while reducing the damage you do. Impeding traps will prevent you from using actions or abilities for a short time. Luring traps will spawn a handful of enemies around you that instantly aggro, and finally toad traps will transform you into a toad, reducing your HP and leaving you helpless. Now a common way to avoid traps is to walk on the edge of a room, as traps tend to spawn closer to the center. The last gimmick you need to be aware of is floor effects. 
When moving between floors, you'll occasionally get a status floor. These can either be detrimental or beneficial, and the only ones you really need to be wary of are the no items or gloom effects, and consider using a serenity for them. Other than that, you also want to be cautious to never use a rage on a no knockback floor because it will cause it to do nothing. With the general advice out of the way, let's start breaking down the different floors. The first 10 floors are going to be relatively safe. The only enemy to really be cautious of is the Palace Hornet. Like any Hornet enemy, it will cast Final Sting if not killed fast enough, so be very careful not to accidentally pull multiple of them. The boss for floor 10 is the Death Gaze. He doesn't do anything that special, but he can hit rather hard, so make sure to pop a Strength and Steal if you don't already have one active, and also consider using a Lust if you have a good supply. Otherwise, just kite the boss around the arena until he dies. Floors 11 to 20 are a bit more dangerous than the first 10, having a couple enemies you need to be wary of, the first of which being the Palace Slime. These enemies have an internal enrage timer that once it ticks down will cause them to explode, killing you. You almost never want to fight more than one of these at a time, and if you do, consider using a Witching. Avoid fighting them in rooms, as if you aggro one and step on a frog or an impeding, you'll likely die. You also need to be cautious of the Cobra. They're not that dangerous by themselves, however, snake enemies have a unique interaction with the frog trap. If you step on a frog trap and aggro a snake, they will one-shot you. The boss of 420 is Spork and handles in a similar manner to Death Gaze. Pop a Strength and Steal if you don't already have one active, and kite them around the arena. Eventually, the boss will move to one side of the arena, spawning two hornets that need to be killed instantly to avoid their final sting, and during this, the boss will be spamming easily avoidable line -aways. If you didn't use a Lust at the start of the fight, consider using it when the Hornets spawn so you can attack both the Hornets and the boss. Floors 21 to 30 are relatively simple, only having one enemy you need to be cautious of, the Skatine, as they can put you to sleep, which can cause you to get hit by AoEs if caught unaware. The boss of 430 is a Hydra and is the first to have actual mechanics. Starting like any boss, make sure to pop a Steel, Strength, and Lust if needed. Once you pull the boss, make sure to head to the edge of the arena immediately and start kiting them around the perimeter. They will drop a grand total of four AoEs, two fire and two ice, and after the fourth, they will head to the center of the arena and start casting fear itself, which will fear anything that is not inside its hitbox. So, after the fourth AoE, you always want to head to the center of the arena. Repeat this process until the boss is defeated. Floors 31 to 40 don't have any enemies that are that dangerous, they just generally hit a bit harder than the previous floors. This set of floors should also be when you reach level 60, at which point you can start speedrunning the floors, only killing the enemies necessary to progress. The boss of floor 40 is the Ixtab, and is likely the most dangerous boss you'll be facing. Like all bosses, make sure that a Steel and Strength is active and start the fight with a Lust. The boss will attack you with a variety of different AoEs, some of which will leave lingering pools, and eventually the boss will spawn two adds that need to be killed immediately. Otherwise, once the boss casts Scream, you'll likely die because the adds will cast Tornado, leaving you at critical HP just before the boss uses a Raid Wide. The last 10 floors are a victory lap. You should be level 60 at this point, and you can speed through the floors as fast as you want. And if you're wanting to stop at 50, you can also just start burning your palms. The boss of floor 50 is Ida, a character you might remember, and is relatively simple. Make sure to use Strength, Steel, and Lust if available, and then kite the boss around the arena and be prepared to dodge in or out for the attack in health. With that, hopefully you've reached the checkpoint. Now, you'll not only be able to spam floors 51 to 60 to level ounce, but you can also unlock Heaven on High and Eureka Orthos once it's released. Or maybe you've decided to go for that Necromancer title. Whatever you do next, best of luck, and remember to have fun with it.